It's time now for the political analysis of Fromm and Fuller. Al Fromm, former political advisor to President Bill Clinton, and Craig Fuller, former political advisor to both President Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush. Good morning, all. Al, I'd like to start with you this week, and uh, let me just list what's going on uh, over the last uh, seven days or so. But obviously, the first one was the uh, uh, FBI uh, serving a search warrant at uh, Donald Trump's residence in Florida. Uh, and that was followed only a couple of days later with President Trump, uh, former President Trump, taking the Fifth Amendment in a tax case in New York. Uh, we're also seeing uh, the investigations of state wrongdoing uh, uh, by Trump people in Pennsylvania and in Georgia. And of course, the January 6th committee continues to uh, do their work with the idea that they will be coming back to prime time soon. And uh, perhaps the most alarming to me was uh, uh, the, the uh, quick time in which uh, the Republicans rallied around Donald Trump. And I guess my question to both of you today is, are we getting to a point where the midterm elections could actually rest on an issue like uh, whether or not somebody respects uh, the rule of law in this country? I guess my answer to that question of, uh, is I think we should ask people uh, who are running for office if they believe in the democratic system and rule of law in elections. I just want to discuss a little bit about what's going on uh, right now. I mean, you know, since 1968, the Republicans have been the party of law and order. Now, uh, they're the uh, party attacking law enforcement. Memories are really short. Uh, in 2016, there are a lot of Democrats who think that James Comey and the FBI uh, uh, flipped the election to Donald Trump. Now the Republicans want to destroy the FBI. Republicans have run on uh, attacking Democrats for wanting to defund the police. Well, they're going to go a step further and defund the FBI. And Donald Trump, you've seen all these clips of him in 2016. Only the mob takes the fifth. He took the fifth 440 times yesterday in a civil case, not even a criminal case. Donald Trump, because I guess reacting to the uh, Hillary Clinton email scandal, uh, 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 signed a law that made disclosing classified information, taking and disclosing classified information, a felony. Now he's the one who has uh, taken boxes of classified information. The party of Benghazi uh, uh, complaining about congressional hearings used for political purposes. And even Lindsey Graham, poor old Lindsey, here he was, uh, former chairman of the Judiciary Committee, the number one Republican in the Senate on judiciary, defying uh, a subpoena from uh, the uh, grand jury in Atlanta. What's going to happen on this election? I've always believed that given the sort of fundamentals of high inflation and higher crime and Biden's approval ratings, that if the Democrats were going to have any chance, they're going to have to change the subject. It's hard to really say what all this chaos this week is going to do, I mean, for the election, because 100 days in with all these multiple investigations going on is a very long time. You know, if nothing else comes out, maybe the Republicans will be able to sort of blunt the impact of these investigations. But my guess is there's a lot more coming out. And people who jump to defend Donald Trump this week are going to find that six weeks or eight weeks or 10 weeks from now, maybe that wasn't the smartest course. Uh, there's some other things that are happening, though, that are really important. In the last two days, we've gotten two inflation uh, reports. Inflation was flat last month. Uh, you know, it's still much higher than it was a year ago, but uh, there were no, there was no overall increase in inflation in the last month. Does that mean that it's going to slow down? Gas prices have fallen now over a dollar a gallon over the last month and a half or two months. Uh, this morning, really important, the progress, uh, the, the uh, producer price index, the old wholesale prices, which often portend uh, future CPI increases, fell in the last month. So there is some sense uh, that uh, 
maybe uh, by September, October, people will actually be feeling a little better about the economy, maybe not. Uh, we've already talked about it. Uh, all these Trump election deniers and people who run against the rule of law and democracy have already uh, changed the odds in the Senate. Uh, 538 now says the Democrats has, have a 60 to 40 chance of holding the Senate. Uh, you know, two months ago, it was probably reversed. And it's all because of the Trump candidates winning. But that's also happening in governor's races. We know that in Maryland, in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin this week, Arizona last week. These are Gubernator, these are election deniers who don't believe in the rule of law, or at least they say they don't, uh, who uh, can win uh, a plurality of Republican primaries, but that's not really uh, uh, probably going to, you know, one of the things I learned in politics is Americans, uh, this country is so big that a plurality of a minority is not a majority in an election. And uh, so uh, we'll see. The House uh, still looks probably pretty good for the Republicans, but here's the, uh, here's the thing that I think we ought to uh, really focus on. This election is going to be decided in the House in swing districts, a lot of them in the suburbs. There are an awful lot of college-educated voters uh, who are in swing districts. They tend to be more responsive to these issues of democracy. They're watching the January 6 hearings more closely. Uh, and particularly if the edge of gas prices goes down, they may be much more open to say, we've got to vote on these democratic values. I think those voters and Hispanic voters who also were very much affected by inflation, but are very patriotic, they also turn out uh, to be a very key uh, uh, constituency this fall. You know, Donald Trump loves to be a victim. He, you know, he's uh, this big, tough guy who was always victimized. Well, I think Dick Cheney was right. He's a coward. And, uh, uh, you know, he's a bully. He's a coward. Uh, and uh, he, uh, uh, we'll see. Uh, he, I just don't think he's going to be play, able to play this victimhood. It may get him, it may, it may hold this that a little while in the Republican Party. But I think the, the country as a whole is going to see through it. And in the end, uh, people are going to want to preserve our democracy. Craig, uh, what, what's your take on this week that was? I mean, uh, a lot of things going on. Uh, and obviously, the midterms uh, are on everybody's minds. What's your take? You know, as you were asking the question, I, I thought of a comment a friend of mine used to make, which was, uh, you know, he said, people keep telling me to cheer up, things could get worse. And sure enough, I cheered up and they got worse. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a phenomenal week. I, I think I, I approach it in thinking about kind of a tale of, uh, of two houses there you, in, in, the, in, the, in the Congress and the Republicans in the US House of Representatives, the Republican leader, Kevin McCarthy, chooses to immediately go out attack the Justice Department, attack the FBI, tell the Attorney General of the United States, get your documents ready and clear your schedule, threatening hearings should McCarthy become speaker. Uh, but in the Senate, McConnell is quite quiet. And I guess the, the point I wanna make is that at least among Republicans, there are those of us, I associate myself with this group, who believe in the rule of law. First of all, the Presidential Records Act was passed in the late 70s, but applied first on January 20th, 1981, the day I entered the White House. And we were counseled, coached, and instructed about the documents we needed to retain and protect, which was basically everything. And the point of view of, of that law boils down to the, the records that are kept and, and developed by officials in the, in the working for the president and vice president are in fact the public's records. We didn't have the right to take them. We didn't have the right to destroy them. We didn't have the right to alter them. And there's a, there's a remarkable structure in place that only grew over time to, to enforce that act. Now, if Kevin McCarthy and certain Republicans think it's wrong for the FBI to go get 
presidential records that shouldn't be in the possession of a former president, then they ought to change the law. But the law was there because a president, Richard Nixon, threatened to destroy his records. And, you know, I may be old fashioned, but I don't believe that we get to choose which laws to obey and, and which to ignore. I don't think the FBI gets to choose which uh, infractions of those laws to investigate and which to ignore. And it seems quite clear from reporting that um, somebody on the inside, probably somebody who is reminded that lying to the FBI is a felony, somebody flipped or maybe more than one person. And the FBI knew exactly what was being held. They knew exactly what was being lied about. They knew exactly where to look for these documents, even though 30 agents spent nine hours in Mar Largo. It is a big house, I guess. Um, but the point being that if if you're if you're immediately going to go out as a public official or anybody and castigate uh, the FBI and the Justice Department, who had to show a judge sufficient evidence and, and reasonable cause to believe these documents were, if you're just going to go out and attack them, then you're really just simply, in my view, after media attention. You know, we have a Republican running for governor in Maryland who now seems to be an expert on the FBI and the Justice Department. He's attacked them and he immediately makes news. McConnell doesn't make much news by waiting to see what, in fact, they found. And so we have we have part of this problem is that we have so many people who've grown up in the era where they want to appear on this screen. They want the opportunity to talk to people, and they like Pavlov taught the dogs. If you go out and you say outrageous things, you're going to get you know your 15 minutes of fame. But I, I do worry that the consequence, as you're suggesting, is that fewer and fewer institutions are trusted. People don't really know who to believe. Um, I absolutely think that on the on the in in, in debates for, for when people engage in. Uh, campaigns for public office during those debates, they should be asked their attitude about the rule of law. And if and if they're attacking, um, you know, lawful activities and investigations, and they say they believe in the rule of law, they ought to be held to account for how they just, under, you know, describe or explain the discrepancy. Um, we, we are a nation in search, I think, of people that can be trusted. Uh, I think, I think we've got a ways to go before we find, you know, such such people, it seems like they're not emerging. Um, and then and then when people like Liz Cheney emerge as somebody who's willing to sacrifice her own seat in Congress for a, a higher good, a greater good, uh, she's under attack, has to be guarded by have armed guards because of the threats against her. So it's a it's a very troubling time. Um, the incidents that you, you know, that you mentioned for the course of one week are kind of are kind of shocking. And this whole notion of going in and having to collect apparently a dozen boxes of documents that were supposed to have been turned over, uh, we'll see what's in them, but uh, it's, it's, just, it's just sort of beyond anything we could imagine. Um, so we're not, in, we're not in a good place, I'm afraid. And uh, I do think it's a time, though, when hopefully good people will rally. Um, and and uh, I, know, I, I do think the nation is looking for those people that can trust. It's going to take some time to find them. You know, Al, the other thing I was going to put on my list was the interesting story that came out yesterday that Biden had brought together a, a bunch of historians. And uh, some of them are commentators on some of the talk shows as well. But they were making a very clear case that our democracy has never been threatened more than it is now. Uh, interesting times to go into a midterm election. I mean, I think that uh, uh, it's not unusual for presidents to bring in historians. Uh, it may have been, it probably was something Donald Trump didn't do because he didn't know what a historian was. But uh, it's not, uh, uh, I remember we did uh, that kind of thing uh, in the Clinton administration. Uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, when Craig was in the uh, in the White House, uh, they brought in uh, uh, historians and experts in particular areas for just background discussions with the president. Uh, so I don't think that's unusual. The, the time of, uh, but this is a very perilous time. Now, is it the most dangerous time? Uh, you know, how does it compare to the Civil War? 
uh, era, uh, the, uh, the 1850s? What about the 1950s and McCarthyism? I mean, we, uh, and, uh, you know, the late 30s and into the 40s uh, with Father Coughlin and uh, uh, the, some of the hard right in, uh, in, in, the, in that period. Uh, we've always uh, gotten through those periods and the key has always been somebody who stood up and Margaret Chase Smith comes to mind for standing up against McCarthy. Where is the Margaret Chase Smith this time? Maybe we're going to look back and think and see that it's Liz Cheney. Uh, uh, the, uh, I mean, look, this is a very perilous time. And if, there, if the part of the Republican Party that has gone off the deep end, gone off the rails, that is a cult for Donald Trump, prevails in our politics. Uh, this democracy is in, you know, is in very grave shape. I have every confidence that's not going to be the case. Liz Cheney may lose the battle next Tuesday, but she's not going to lose. You know, as we were talking about all the stuff that's going on this week, uh, uh, and the question about what uh, it's in those documents that are taken that, that Trump has uh, took to uh, Mar-a-Lago and didn't give back. I guess in the in the last two weeks, we've also learned that the uh, uh, Secret Service had uh, somehow lost all the texts around January fifth and sixth. The Defense Department texts are missing. Taking the fifth in a civil case it just seems to be incredible. He, there, there are got to be criminal activities that they are trying to cover up. And I have every confidence in the end, and probably in the not too distant future, we're going to have a pretty good idea of what all that is. Yeah. And whether or not he's prosecuted, brought to justice, goes to jail, I think his political career will be over. Greg, Greg you have the benediction this time. He asked an interesting question about historians, and Ronald Reagan actually sat down, uh, at least in his first term when I was there, because I was helped organize it, sat down with futurists. And very few people actually knew about it until later. We didn't make any public announcements. But people who were in the business of looking at the bigger picture, thinking ahead, where, thinking about where the nation was going, would, would come in prior to the, the development of the State of the Union speech, so in the fall. And, and President Reagan thoroughly enjoyed it. There'd be long lunches, thoughtful lunches, uh, the futurists would come in, not with PowerPoint presentations, they would just come in to talk. And and so what Biden did the other day, I think, is actually very important. And I, I think that one of the one of the things the president really needs to do is help the nation look forward. And bringing people in who can add perspective to that is very valuable, both in the telling of the story that it happened, but also in terms of what the president says after that. Um, I would say that this State of the Union speech in 2023 is an extremely important speech. I, we will come through the 2022 election. It'll be what it will be. But President Biden really does need to help explain to the nation where we're going as a nation and how, and how he views that. And the more people he can bring in who are not backwards looking, but are forward looking, I think the better, the better off we'll be. And I think Again, I think the nation looks to a president to do that and appreciates it when they do it. And I think it's particularly important. And, it, and it's particularly important for the White House to develop messaging that's uh, that's looking forward and, and not looking back. And, and sadly, mo many people in, this, in the faction of the party that I'm in, the Republican Party, are absolutely looking back. They're going to continue to look back. I do think, like Al, though, they're going to be left behind. And Al's point that there are some good numbers out. Uh, some of the investment portfolios are up again. People are beginning to feel like, you know, we're on some at some level, we're headed in, the, in a better direction. If that continues, that's that's quite significant. But uh, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm putting a lot of hope in the forward looking uh, speech in in uh, 2023. Al. I hope I hope you help help write it somehow. <laughs> That's all the time we have. Al Fromm, Craig Fuller, thank you so much indeed. We will see you next week.